how do I give you more? Throw you in the deep end and let you swim and hopefully you can swim and you get to manage. And that means I don't have to do this task because hopefully you can do it. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. Enix Sears here, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running and managing an architectural practice that allows you to do your best work more often. If you haven't already, head it over to smartpracticemethod.com to pick up your free access to that 60-minute firm owner training. What are you waiting for? We've condensed over a decade plus of experience and best practices into a powerful 60-minute training for firm leaders. You can get free access by going to smartpracticemethod.com. Today, I'm joined by Drew Deering. Drew is an associate principal and studio operations leader at Moody Nolan which is the largest African-American-owned firm in the United States with 12 offices. He also runs the Washington, D.C. office of the firm. Now, Moody Nolan was awarded the 2021 AI Architecture Firm Award, which is uh, a singular honor. It's awarded to one firm every single year, so quite an achievement. Drew, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Fantastic having you on here. So tell us, what is an associate principal? What are your primary responsibilities at Moody Nolan as what does an associate principal do? Uh, so our associate principals they have many roles. Uh, you know, in architecture, we all have different specialties. You know, some are design, some are um, the practice. You know, that's probably my specialty is the project management side of it. Uh, so that's really where my role is, is helping lead the firm, not just Chicago and D.C., as you mentioned before, um, but I'm also part of a task force overall, the organization, help ma- making sure our project managers get the support they need, the information, or, you know, the processes are always changing. Uh, so helping update those processes and making sure they understand them and doing what they need to do to make our firm successful. Oh, I love that. Project management is something that we haven't talked a lot about here on the, on, the, on the podcast. If you had to define what a project manager does, what does a project manager actually do? Uh, that's a hard one, actually. I know. So you know, it changes <laughs> from project to project and you know, things. The, uh, the basics for me, you know, actually, we struggle as a Moody Nolan, not struggle, but really try to define, you know, because you go, as you said before, the project architects and the project management, you know, but for me, it's kind of making sure the projects are running smoothly. I don't re- try to struggle with the word of project management, but more like a project executive, right? Trying to make sure the owner gets the information they need. You're answering their questions. Your team's got the information they need and moving forward. Because we have the team that's doing the drawings and getting all those details and all the fun side of architecture, but we still got to pay the bills, you know? So making sure we got contracts for all from our clients and all our consultants. Uh, of course, you know, I work with, worked on some big projects with 12 consultants on a project. So they're all asking for money, you know, trying to make sure the pro- the flow of money is happening effectively so we can keep our doors open and our consultants can keep their doors open also. So at M- Moody Nolan, are the project managers, project executives, I love how you use that term, are they responsible for the, the budget and the finances of the project as well? Yes. Okay. So we've worked with the principal, help finalize the fee. Uh, and then when the projects go, you know, they're managing to that fee making sure our projects are staffed correctly and always that fine balance of trying to get projects done, but also meeting our, you know, profitability for our projects also. So, And what software tool are you using right now to manage the profitability and keep track of that? Currently we're using Deltex Vantage Point. Uh, so one of the industry leading softwares, at least for the large firms of the AAC community, uh, with that. So, you know, every software we've gone through our iteration since my many years of being in the profession, all are plus and minuses, but it's working well for us so far. So good. When you're looking at managing a project, what's, what are the primary key performance indicators that you're looking at that you would pull up to see if something's on track or off track? You know, my big thing, I talked to our project managers yesterday about, you know, making sure our work plans are done, you know, so the expected hours, you know, are meeting our fee, uh, but we all know schedules happen or those last minute phone calls from clients needing, I need this drawing, you know, f- so for me, the big one is the planned hours versus the actual hours, you know, so you really start to see a project go up or down very quickly when you start to see staff put more hours on a project and having to correct that path forward. And how do you correct that? Cause, you know, architecture is a hard t- thing and lots of hours. Um, 
typically is like, I need more time. And it's like, we don't have more time. You know, the deadline's coming. Uh, fees always running out. So how to manage to that and making sure communication with your team about what those expectations are. And how do you course correct if need be? Yeah. And how, how, what would be some strategies for course correcting that you find useful when something's going out sideways like that? Uh, for me, it's very much the transparency, you know, set of setting expectations with team, you know, understanding about what their hours are, you know, and then I have that hard conversations with project architects where the teams of going, hey, we overran this one, but how do we fix it? What can we do? What can we don't have to do? Or do we really need to do that task? You know, I know you're passionate about that part of the project, but, you know, how do, do we, is this really part of our deliverables? Uh, and really needs for the success of the project. Yeah, that's fantastic. And generally, in your experience, is it hard to find architects with project management expertise? Because you know every architect have they have different skill sets. Some are really well suited for project management; others aren't. What's your kind of anecdotal feel based upon architects in general? Do you find that we're we're more suited for project management, or is it more like the diamond in the rough? Uh, for me, it's probably on the diamond and the rough. I think, uh, you know, I just saw the other thing, like we're trained in design and the technical aspects of a building, but we have very little education of project management or, you know, uh, even some of my staff was like, I want to be a project manager, but you realize that's the finance of things versus, you know, we all got an architect, you know, always got an architecture for the love of buildings, the love of space, you know, creating cool objects. Uh, so it's always hard, you know, but f unfortunately for many of our profession, that's where they see their path towards leadership, right? Or promotion is through that, but uh, we've been making a very hard effort to say, you know, no, there is a path just to do project architect to the senior. We're trying to promote senior architects in the leadership roles that you can still be a principal and still doing project architects instead of just the typical I'm a intern to a what we call project coordinators, project architect, project manager, and then principal. But I believe the project architect is still the most responsible and most powerful thing on a project because they're the ones seeing the realization of this building. And are you aware of any any particular tools for training project managers or sharpening their skills out there right now? How do you train uh, your team and and any external third party? trainings or how do you there are some other ones uh you know yours um bqe is a very good one uh our friend here from chicago and his firm um you know psmj has some you know my favorite thing lately is the business harvard review daily emails you know it's just about mm. managing teams and yeah. setting expectations you know it's just like how to deal with burnout or some always interesting interesting ones i check my email every morning to find out you know just it's the you know Harvard Business School you know and some techniques I mean, not just architecture but we all deal with very similar things of how to deal with people I think that's my big thing is moving into leadership of just the people side of the profession not just uh, how to deal with keeping the water out of a building yeah sure with some some of your insights on that how do you well this is curious I'm, I'm curious how do you how do you approach having difficult conversations with people you know they messed up uh, you don't want to come in heavy-handed and, and really crush their spirits but you need to make sure that the expectations set and that there's accountability what's your yeah, approach think, in that situation I think that's the big one you know accountability you know even have the hard conversations very people are risk adverse I think it's we are as human beings but you know sometimes we have to do that to make sure things get done and appropriate uh you know really just having that soft conversation you know it's not yelling you know or anything it's just like hey you know i know you're trying but you know we couldn't quite do that shouldn't be doing that uh let's talk about why it happened and figure out what the best way forward yeah, beautiful. Now, how does that relate to your when you say you run the DC office? What does that What does that mean for you? What What does running the DC office entail? Uh, actually, it's been quite an adventure here lately. So we started the pandemic with two people in DC, and we're up to fourteen now. Oh, wow, rapid growth. Uh, you know, we were into a we work similar space uh, before the pandemic. Now, uh, last month, we opened up our own own space. Uh, so it's been great. Um, but we have lots of projects going in in the Baltimore, D.C. area. Uh, so that means getting lots of interviews to get the best staff uh, on these projects, uh, making sure they have all the resources, which is a very big thing of a build out of a space, which is interesting as an architect, building out your own space, which is uh, interesting. 
Uh, but then, you know, with all those interviews and making sure they're getting all the resources they need, new hires, onboarding, uh, and all the things like that. Um, so, yeah. Right Luckily, now, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's very hard to hire staff. So being able to staff up to 14 people is really incredible. What would you attribute... Because we hear from so many firm owners, like, we can't find staff. There's no one out there. We don't get any resumes. Obviously, you've made it work. So what do you think is the key thing that, do you know much about the hiring practices? Can you speak to that? Uh, yeah. You know, for me, it's a lot of, well, honestly, the 2021 firm of the year helped a lot. You know, our namesake out there, people wanting to come to our firm. Uh, but for me, even throughout my career, it's all about relationships. You know, uh, I have a great team member in D.C., He's teaching part time, you know, so he's able to pull in students that are graduating and finding those or the relationships. Uh, even here in Chicago, as we've gone through our years, you know, of knowing people in the business and a system of network of people, even other people, you know, uh, within the office going, hey, you know anyone, you know, because I think it's always the best when you're trying to find a relationship, you know, and someone can say great things to your firm and encourage people to get their friends and colleagues over. Uh, versus just that blind thing out of the off the classified ads, whatever we do it these days, uh, to get them in, you know, because people that know you and know have a relationship with the firm are more likely to stay versus someone and just coming in for a job and then unfortunately leaving very quickly. You know, retention is a very important thing um, to make employee satisfaction and you know keep the the process going and understanding that process. For you, what are the most important things to keep employees happy, motivated, and engaged? Uh, for me, it's just making sure I'm, for, for me lately, it's just being present, uh, you know, in the staff. You know, it's fortunate thing in my job of being there. I'm trying to be in the office four days a week, make sure I catch all my team, but they're always there asking me questions, um, being aware, you know, of what's going on, uh, being approachable, you know, so they can't ask me questions whether, you know, I have a brand new person just graduated. It's like, I don't know about vacation. It's like, oh, I forgot about what it was like 25 years ago when I started, <laughs> you know, those simple questions which we take for granted. Uh, but being open enough to say they're okay to come to me. And I was like, can you help me understand what it means and how do I do this? Those really simple things. Um, but communicating, talking to them, you know, we all have different communication styles. Like I have one team, we just have exchanged weird memes on teams these days. <laughs> it's kind of our fun, approachable thing. Um, really also everyone's got different needs also. So, you know, everyone's trying to do things. I think that's an interesting thing in the pandemic since the pandemic and everything of understanding how everyone's changed and so on, and that work-life balance. And it's not quite the same as it was a couple of years ago. Absolutely. So looking at getting the, the Architecture Firm of the Year Award and, and the business practices at the firm, what would you say are the key things that make Moody Nolan such a successful practice from a business perspective? Um, a successful practice from a business standpoint. Uh, I don't know, 40 years in business, uh, yeah, that's which is helpful. It, yeah. And what, <laughs> that's cre helpful. what created that success? What are the, what are the, what is it like to work there? The things that you see in, in the organization, the structure, the things that are happening behind the scenes to make such a solid structure? Uh, it was very interesting. It just Kurt Moody, you know, his philosophy and, you know, uh, he's like a gentle giant, you know, it's very firm, but a very nice touch hand, you know. Uh, my favorite thing is like you can all in the Columbus office where he's based, you can always find what we call the kitchen table, which is the big uh, break room table in the center of the office. And they're sketching away now these days. Um, but he's approachable. You know, it was like I could always text Kurt Moody, Jonathan Moody anytime. You know, our leaders are accessible and so on. Um, but also people being creative or I think even my local boss here, our partner, in the Chicago office is we still have an entrepreneurial spirit. You know, if you find something that needs to be fixed uh, within the firm, uh, say a process or something that could do better, there's always encouragement within the firm for someone to speak up and figure out, hey, this doesn't work. I think I have a better way. And that's always being welcomed into uh, of our changing process. That's kind of how that, my... Do you have that systematized, some, some formal process by which people can give feedback or is it just more organic? I think it's more organic, you know, but, um, so there's but it's that always culture of listening when people give feedback, you can, 
people free free to do that. Right. Or just more of an encouragement, you know, it was mm-hmm. like, hey, you know, someone, you know, with our my mentorship internally within the office of, you know, hey, I don't think this works. Well, it's like, hey, figure out, you know, do you have a better idea of how to do it and spend some time to make it work better? And yeah. when you figure it out, let's broadcast it throughout the firm so we all do better, right? You know, because we're probably all struggling with the same problem. You know, you're just, it's being hidden in one person versus communicating that out for everyone. I think what's interesting, we started a team channels overall of just like different things throughout the office. Uh, you know, it was like a technical issue or a software issue, but it's, it's kind of a brain thing, you know, the crowdsourcing of ideas or, hey, I found this awesome way to do something or use a software we have to a better thing and it gets broadcast to the thing and we're all better for it. So what else would you, would you attribute the success to? Um, um, I think just a die hardness and always pushing, uh, doing, you know, some, we've had some struggles, uh, also being an African American owned firm, uh, not always being able to have a seat at the table, but always kind of pushing through that and trying to do our best and help represent that, represent that as much as we can. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's quite, quite remarkable. I know uh, the largest African American owned firm in the United States, but I would imagine the world is the Genova larger one in the world. Um, I don't know, honestly. Yeah. I wonder so, if it is. Probably Could be, you yeah, know, that's pretty, pretty remarkable. And so Kurt Moody, you know him personally, and, and you describe him as a gentle giant. Describe more of his personality and leadership style. Um, you know, it's very much that uh, fatherly figure, you know, um, but also kind of stern when you need to, you know. Uh, like Currently, you know, we're at the end of the year trying to get as much cash in the door as possible at the end of the year. So Kurt on our leadership calls, making sure we're doing what we need to do to make sure we're profitable for the year. And the oh, that's that very interesting. So focus on the money, not not that it's the primary thing, but it's it's not something we neglect or overlook or we're afraid to talk about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I'm doing a project with them, a high profile project, you know, so I have design talks with them at the same time, mm-hmm. you know, but he still have a great passion for design. Uh, we all have or as uh, we make the joke is like I, we all went to architecture school, too. Um, but it's the thing of running a business um but it's also very interesting for me as kurt's transitioning or has transitioned to jonathan but kurt now gets to do the fun stuff that we all wanted to do because he's given up running the business to a, to jonathan but as i said before now he gets to spend the days drawing and making the nice pictures to make the great projects again instead of the yeah. day-to-day running a business side of it for you what's what's the most enjoyable part about being an associate principal what you say? Uh, for me, you know, it helped reach my collaboration uh, with other firm leaders across the country. You know, so we're instead of just being centrally located within Chicago, uh, very often on a daily basis, I'm collaborating with, say, uh, associate principal out of Boston, you know, or Nashville uh, on things. So it was kind of very more interesting, um, you know, or getting exposure to other processes you know i'm i am on the business side of the profession i always probably have been uh, but getting more and more into that operation side uh, the financial side of the, the thing so mm. what would you what would you say would be the hardest part or the part you dislike the most about being an associate principal or your current role um you know, having to be the bad guy sometimes, you know, as you mentioned before, <laughs> things don't go right. Someone has to step up and say, don't do that. That's not allowed. Uh, you, sh- you shouldn't do that, you know, which is, I think, as we said, you know, we're not quite trained that way. We're trained in the technical aspects of a building, but the people, the HR kind of side of that project of architecture uh, is probably the hardest part to it all. Yeah. As a project manager, how do you manage your own personal time? Do you have any secrets or hacks around that? Use some little app on your phone to keep track of all the many to-dos. You time block on your calendar. What? How do you manage your own personal productivity, Drew? Uh, but using time block, you know, my favorite thing I've found out uh, through Microsoft, it was a put focus time on my calendar. Mm. So there's an 
and it'll go through and look through your calendar where you have large blocks of time and say focus time uh, and also shut everything else off in your system so you're not getting those constant distractions uh, from team members so it puts everything quiet which is weird because you're not quite used to it all of a sudden you're in focus time and where did all the chatter in the background go uh, and, and things like that uh, I'm still struggling personally between paper you know my to-do list on a piece of paper and the app um, I, right now I'm still on a piece of paper the old school way of the list of to-dos um, but still also trying to use like one note and things like that to keep track of notes and th and other things that need to happen uh, so yeah so you like that... you like you like one note what else do you use from a from an app side any favorite apps to share uh not so much you know i really trying to actually i think you just said as a balance of like trying to turn it off mm -hmm. uh you know or we've get inundated with so many apps and products you know i talked to our tech team you know like we got all this stuff these days but how do we use them the best we can uh, i think there's another one called tonic dm which files all my emails away for me which is great because just the time process of you know I get hundreds of emails a day how do I deal with those and try to keep my inbox as clean as possible when it's just a constant barrage of emails and what's useful and what do I need to look at? And especially as a leader, I get copied on lots of things. Yeah. Is it just getting copied or is it something I need to respond to? You know, that's kind of a always ongoing struggle of keeping track of all that data that's coming in. Yeah. How do you do that now? Do you just write it down in, in a physical form on paper or? Uh, really just flag the ones that are important and try to get away as fast as possible, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, luckily, uh, Microsoft Outlook, you can flag things and it puts it away in a folder. I've made rules in Outlook, so it says mark it as red, yep. put it in the folder. Yeah. So it gets it away as quickly as possible. And those little rules stick on the top of the bar, so it's just click, click, you know, my top six projects that I'm working on. So it's typically where those emails come from. So click and it's done and you know, my goal of the pandemic was to get to net zero email, which is a huge goal. Uh, I didn't quite make it. It got bigger, but at least trying to get big down to there. At least they're all red, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so it was very detail oriented person. Those people with the thousand unread emails, I don't understand that at yeah. all. So you like, you like keeping a well dusted, well, uh, well cleaned out email inbox. Hopefully that's my goal. At least I don't think I'll ever get there, but I'll at least try to, at least my personal one is much better yeah so yeah. and i also i think that's another tool you know i have my work stuff i have my personal email probably multiple email accounts to keep that information uh separated like the subscriptions to like the business journal those emails and things like that or mm -hmm. its own email so it's like i don't need to check that all the time yeah, yeah. Uh, it's only periodical of checking those versus the day-to-day hour-by-hour emails mm -hmm. of course <laughs> Now let's go back to project management. When you're when you're building out project plans, and I would imagine you're probably not doing that anymore. Is that right, or do you still do project um, plans at your level? Still doing that. Still doing yeah. that. So we're still so responsible for yeah. project plans, or really more of a collaboration between project architect and project management, okay. understanding fee versus all those tasks that need to be done for the production side okay. of creating the documents. And do they do they involve you in the um, in the conversation when the fee sets or do they just say, Hey, here's the fee, figure this out, uh, make it work. Depends on the project. Some of, we have some very large ones, which are really kept at the principal level, yeah. but the smaller ones, yes. You know, we're trying to get trained, you know, keep everyone moving forward, moving up, understanding what those fees are. Smaller projects, I develop them, review with my principal and it was a check. Uh, but you know, we have some very large projects going on. Uh, those are, typically developed up there at the higher levels, but still involves, you know, of understanding, you know, what percentages we're trying to achieve based on project type, how much fee we're trying to retain internally versus an associate architect we're typically teamed with or all the other line of consultants that are required for some of our projects. Yeah. And the process to be able to determine the fee, are you going back to the information within Dell Tech that you're using? Do you map it out based upon how many sheets or details what's your process for setting a fee or do you have one that you typically like to use 
Uh, we're trying to do both ways, you know, so historical data on similar projects, uh -huh. uh, you know, so what are those, uh, you know, then still based on construction type and percentages. Uh, the sheet one lately, you know, I've been doing that, but that's very interesting because we're a hundred percent Revit based, you know, so what is a sheet these days? Uh, because really my team's building a 3D model and just throwing things on a sheet. Uh, so I've, I've been personally thinking about that methodology these days. And is that really valid even in the profession? Because I can just generate an infinite amount of sheets these days and what does it matter? Um, and so on. So yeah. mostly the fee base, construction base, you kind of cross check uh, based on construction data. You know, are we getting the true cost from the owner? Uh, what is our information saying from our cost estimators or our historical information about project costs? Uh, and, you know, then we, have we done a similar project? You know, every project's unique, which is kind of hard because you just can't say this one's similar to that one. Um, but at least get us a ballpark of understanding where we successful in that and what's good or bad about what happened. And let's catch ourselves to make sure we don't make that same mistake or benefit that we had on that last one. So one one of the challenges that small small firm owners face, Drew, is that uh, a lot of times they'll accept too much work. So they have too much work on the boards. In other words, the work starts to get away from them. They're like, "Oh wow, I I'm under resourced. Not enough time to get all the work done." Let's say you were coming you were coming in now as the consultant because you have a lot of project management experience. How would you handle? What recommendation advice would you give to someone in that situation? Uh, uh even we still have it. Even you know, so lots of projects going on. You know, but uh, we always. I always challenge my staff, you know, of like trying to take ownership or trying to manage up, like, how can I help you? You know, I think, it I think there should be very much dependent on the, on our junior staff uh, or other staff to help us succeed. Right. Very much as an owner, we're taking on this burden ourselves to do it all. But how do we, how do we delegate downwards to make sure that everyone's involved in the process uh, and also help their development? Because I always say, or I had speech to my staff the other day, my job is to make my boss's life easier, you know? So when that's successful, you know, everyone's successful, you know, typically the top's the hardest working people and they've earned that title, you know, but my job is to help manage up and take responsibility from my boss. The people underneath me are trying to take response, should be trying to take responsibility to me. Uh, you know, it helps their development and also helps our bottom line because you're pushing the, the, you know, the hourly rate down too on each project, you know, so when some junior architect can take on a major responsibility on a project, you know, we're helping that project leader, uh, with their responsibility, but also helping develop our junior staff, you know, so I think small projects, same thing with, you know, I, I think the benefit of Moody Nolan is like I have a 20 person office, you know, but we're 350 nationwide, yeah. but I'm a small practice here in Chicago or smallish yeah. need to find a small medium practice. But as like, I have 20 people in Chicago, which is similar to a small, uh, a small practice yeah. and trying to do that, you know, of like, Hey, I know you're a couple years out of school, but you seem to have a knack for this task. How do I give you more? How do I let you swim, throw you in the deep end and let you swim and hopefully you can swim and you get to manage. And that means I don't have to do this task because hopefully you can do it. Beautiful. So you delegate down. What else would you do? Let's say you've already you've done that. You've delegated down. Now all your team members are fully booked up and there's still too much work. Uh, I don't know. That's a tough one. Uh, you know, especially I think it's an interesting point where we are currently in the economy. You know, can you say no? Uh, we've gotten a lot of work lately and it's like, does this project help our portfolio? You know, I think that's really what I've been amazed by our leadership mm -hmm. recently going, do we need to take this project? You know, before, you know, growing a business, we had to take everything just to stay afloat or just because it's available. But, you know, how does this help us really to pause and say, is this helping grow my portfolio? Is this helping grow my team? You know, sometimes we take projects just to give, you know, uh, other staff an opportunity to do things um, that we typically do or does it really even help in cash flow you know different projects cash flow differently than other ones uh but what is that mix there and you got to ask your question what is it you're really trying to accomplish uh, with your practice you know 
you have to take every project, you know, that just, as you said, kind of burns yourself out. And, but where does it help you get to that next step and helping move forward, right? You just don't want to be stuck where you're at. I've been part of those firms where they're just still doing the same thing they've been doing for 20 years. Mm. Um, but, you know, where do I, for me lately, we've been working through our strategic plan or through AI Chicago, we work through our strategic plan, which is very interesting. Uh, but just like setting goals for yourself, like, and bouncing that questions off, of like, does this meet our strategic goals? Does this meet what we want to do? And how does it help push us forward? Yeah. Last question for you today, Drew, which is this, uh, what would you tell yourself if you could sit down with the earlier version of yourself starting out in your career, what advice would you give to yourself? Um, well, that's a different one. Uh, just keep trying, uh, you know, or, or don't give up, but still have like, I was having a discussion with a team member the other day, uh, you know, it was like at one point, I just got very tired of working on a certain project type. And it's like, I was very irritated with uh, the owner side. So then I tried the owner side, you know, and it was like, oh, that didn't work out either. It's just, as I always say, the grass uh, isn't always greener on the other side. It's just a different shade of green. Uh, but I learned a lot from that, uh, that, challenge uh you know i was part of a uh, fortune 500 company and their bedded real estate team but wasn't for that specific skills but i learned so many skills on a different side like i had to do presentations to a fortune 500 ceo and having to get entire campus redevelopment down to a page uh you know <laughs> which was and i'm getting changing a million and a half square feet of space but those are very simple skills you know of learning something different or understanding why things are done from a different perspective, which is always interesting. Well, Drew, thanks for joining us here on the Business of Architecture podcast today. It's been my pleasure, uh, and thanks for the conversation. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.